You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on SCAT TV or some community access television station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast to them I say thank you or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page either way you could join me I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic which is movies so for this show I have four movies to review for you and I'm also going to go over the nominees for the Razzie Awards last week I went over the nominees for the Oscars this week I'm doing the Razzies I thought about doing them both for one show but then I thought but, well, I, I don't know if I want to dedicate the whole show to the Oscars and the Razzies. That show will happen, actually, after the Oscars and the Razzies. The Razzies on March 3rd and the Oscars on March 4th. Meanwhile, let's get into our first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? The top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And there are a few surprises here and there, particularly by those Oscar-nominated movies that weren't even in the top 10 last week. But the movie that was number one at the box office was Maze Runner, The Death Cure, the third movie in the Maze Runner series, which I assume is the last. But because I didn't see the first Maze Runner, movie i didn't see the third one either so that's not one of the movies i'll be reviewing for the show but in any event it made 24.2 million dollars this past weekend at the u.s box office against a budget of 62 million dollars internationally maze runner the death cure made 108.1 million dollars making it not a hit yet here in the states but around the world it is so far a tentative hit and off to a very great start Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, is knocked off of the number one spot for the first time in three weeks. This week, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, earned $16.1 million. Against a budget ranging from $90 to $110 million, Jumanji has so far grossed $337.8 million here in the States and $821.8 million around the world. So it hasn't earned the same amount of money as Star Wars The Last Jedi, which is ironic because Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle was number one at the box office for three one week longer than that Star Wars movie. But still, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Hostiles is the newest entry to this list in the sense that it's been out for six weeks. This week is number three at the box office. Last week, I kid you not, it was number 23. And that's mainly because when it opened on December 22nd of last year, it opened in select cities and select theaters. In fact, I kind of had to jump through hoops to see it here in Boston a couple of weeks ago. But now it's open in theaters nationwide, and people are apparently digging this movie. This weekend, it made a record high $10.1 million at the box office. Against the Budget ranging from $39 to $50 million, Hostels has so far made $12 million even here in the States and $13.1 million internationally, which means it's not, a yet, yet, it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but we'll have to see if it makes more money than that. The Greatest Showman actually... It made an interesting feat in its sixth week in release, having the advantage of being in theaters nationwide longer than Hostiles had. Last week was number five. This week it climbed to number four, having earned $9.6 million at the box office. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far earned $126.5 million here in the States and $259.5 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. The Post is also generating a lot of Oscar buzz, and while it slid from number four last week to number five this week, doing kind of a do si with The Greatest Showman, it's still doing really well, having earned $9.1 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $50 million, The Post has so far earned $58.8 million here in the States and $83 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit both here in the States and around the world.
12 Strong was number two at the box office last week. This week it fell to number six, having only earned $8.7 million. But against a budget of $35 million, 12 Strong has so far earned $29.8 million here in the States and $35.2 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States. It may inch its way to being a tentative hit here in the States. And around the world, it is so far a tentative hit by a very, very narrow margin, but still a tentative hit nonetheless. Den of Thieves also took a tumble. Last week it was number three, this week it was number seven. So it fell as many places as 12 Strong did. But this weekend it earned $8.6 million. Against a budget of $30 million, Den of Thieves has so far earned $28.8 million here in the States and $31.6 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but it may become a tentative hit next week. But around the world, just like 12 Strong, it is very narrowly a tentative hit. The Shape of Water in its nine weeks in release was never in the top 10 until now. Last week it was number 16 at the box office. This week, having opened in theaters nationwide and also been nominated for 13 Oscars, it's number 8 at the box office, having earned $5.9 million. And I have the feeling that the word of mouth is going to generate about this movie because it is really great and one of my top 10 favorite films of the year but against a budget of 19.5 million dollars so a relatively low budget the shape of water has so far earned 37.9 million dollars here in the states and 51.9 million dollars around the world making it a tentative hit here in the states very very close to being a certified hit and it may be a certified hit by next week here in the states but around the world it is already there Paddington 2 also took a tumble, strangely enough. It earned $5.7 million at the U.S. box office, sliding from number 9 this week from number 6 last week. But against a budget of $50 million, it's not doing as well as expected here in the States, but around the world it's doing excellently. Here in the States it earned $32.1 million. Around the world has earned $180.2 million, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is certified by quite a bit. And finally, number 10 of the box office is a movie I have never heard of, let alone seen. It's called Padmavat, which as you can imagine is from India. It earned $4.4 million at the U.S. box office in its first week in release. Against a budget of $32.3 million, or 215 rupees, Padmavat has earned earned $4.9 million here in the States and $32.2 million around the world. It's not a hit yet. yet oh, man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go, fish that. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hi, listen to me, Ed Robleski, every Wednesday from 5 to 7 for Talking Hendrix, where we will celebrate the music and legacy of Jimi Hendrix's career and much more. Tune in every Wednesday from 5 to 7 when we hear on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Hostels, which is a brand new western starring Christian Bale, Rosamund Pike, and Wes Studi, amongst several other actors. It's directed by Scott Cooper, who is an American director from... Abington, Virginia, and he's directed such films as Crazy Heart from 2009, which won several Academy Awards, Black Mass from 2015, which I thought was very underrated, and another one starring Christian Bale, which I have not seen, called Out of the Furnace. It also stars Casey Affleck and Zoe Saldana. That movie came out in 2013 before I started the show, so that one passed me by, but I may go back to it because from what I've seen from Crazy Heart and Black Mass Scott Cooper is a very competent director and he certainly shows that in this movie Hostiles Hostiles is a western by all accounts and it takes place in 1892 where a legendary army captain 
played by Christian Bale here, reluctantly agrees to escort a Cheyenne chief and his family through dangerous territory. This Cheyenne chief, by the way, is played by legendary actor Wes Studi, who I don't actually know is an Academy Award nominee, but he's certainly been in several great movies, and he certainly shines in this film as well. The movie also stars Rosamund Pike as a woman who has her husband and three children killed by a Comanche war party who not only murder her family, but proceed to scalp them as well. So when Captain Joseph Blocker, again played by Christian Bale, is rounding up this Apache family and uh, the Cheyenne chief, he comes across... Rosalie, again played by Rosamund Pike, as she is actually nursing her dead children. This is probably one of the starkest, saddest scenes in this film, but it certainly packs a punch, as does the rest of the movie. But it sets the movie off, particularly the story part of the movie, on the right note. But Rosamund Pike is one of those actresses who, yes, she has been nominated for an Academy Award for her role in Gone Girl, which was very much deserved. But even after Gone Girl, she hasn't quite gotten the critical acclaim she deserves. But in any event, she is great in this movie, as is Christian Bale as the reluctant hero. And Wes Studi certainly has one of those roles where he doesn't say a lot, but he certainly reflects a lot of emotion in his performance. And this is a movie that is very much in the same scope of the Western genre as other Western epics such as the searchers and probably most recently unforgiven a lot of people have said that hostiles a lot of critics particularly those like chris nashawadi have called hostiles the best modern western since unforgiven i would probably i don't know if i'd agree with that completely because the hateful eight by quentin tarantino was certainly another great great western albeit one that was a little unorthodox but i think in the same vein as unforgiven hostiles is certainly one of the better westerns of recent years especially in recent years where a lot of people almost unofficially declare the western genre to be dead I don't think it's dead, but it's certainly it's certainly in a period of limbo in a lot of the same in a way that it wasn't as it isn't as popular now as it was in the 40s and 50s. But still, a vast majority of the westerns that have come out, except for maybe The Lone Ranger, are good solid movies and. Hostels is probably one of the better movies of 2017 that narrowly made my list of the top 10 best films of the year. But I thought everyone in this film acted incredibly well. You certainly have characters that come and go, such as a master sergeant by the name of Thomas Metz, who's played in this movie by another underrated actor, Rory Cochran. You also have Jesse Plemons as Rudy Kidder, a lieutenant under Christian Bale. And you also have... Good supporting performances by the likes of Timothy Chalamet, who is also in the movie Call Me By Your Name, Adam Beach, Ben Foster, and other actors who make cameos such as Scott Wilson. So this movie makes the best of tracking shots and panoramic views and makes the Pacific West look beautiful, <laughs> especially in such a gritty film and this movie doesn't really pull any punches punches when it comes to showing the casualties of of war in this case and even though it takes place in 1892 which is 27 years after the civil war commenced there's still a lot of war weariness from many of the characters in this film who are civil war Civil War veterans. And in addition to that, the lives that these these people are living are like a war. And Hostels, again, is a movie I enjoyed. I'm very surprised that it didn't get as wide a release as it should have, because I would have rather seen this movie in theaters nationwide than, say, other films that came out around the time this film was released in New York and L.A., 
and not the rest of the country. Like, for instance, downsizing was a disappointment. Also, Father Figures wasn't worth seeing on the on the big screen. But those movies came out, and this movie didn't um, in, in wide release. But enough about my gripings of distribution. I think that Hostiles is one of Christian Bale's better movies. I can't say for sure whether it's better than the several other great movies that Christian Bale has done, but certainly amongst Westerns, it is his best. Rosamund Pike, again, commands a great performance in this movie, and the scenes where it shows her grieving over the death of her family are really heartbreaking. And also when she reacts negatively to the Apache family, for obvious reasons, that's also really heartbreaking. But again, it's important to remember that it's the Comanches who attacked and murdered her family, and it's the Apaches who are the allies in this film. So I I think I've met, spoken enough about Hostels. It's a movie that didn't get a ton of award recognition this year, but that that happens to a lot of great movies, but it still gets my rating of a knockout. I think it is a good, solid Western, certainly not afraid to pack any any grit into the story. And also, just about every actor in this movie was great. So, Hostels is well worth seeing if you haven't seen it already, and that's really all I have to say about it. Multiple choice parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you, A, get spiritual? Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. Oh. B. Find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C. Show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Greatest Showman. The Greatest Showman is the latest starring Hugh Jackman and Michelle Williams and is directed by Michael Gracie. If Michael Gracie doesn't sound particularly familiar to you, that is because he is actually making his feature film debut with this movie. Before... The Greatest Showman. He actually directed a video short from 2004 and also worked in the visual effects department um, in such movie or such movies as TV sh- and TV shows as The Magician and Ned Kelly. So this guy's been around, but this is his directorial de- blah, directorial debut. And The Greatest Showman, upon first glance, looks very much like a movie in the style of Baz Luhrmann. In fact, if you hadn't told me that Michael Gracie directed this film, I I would have thought it was Baz Luhrmann because it has a lot in common with Baz Luhrmann. Not only the elaborate musical numbers, but also the musical numbers being more modern and probably more accessible to a modern audience than music in the late 1890s or early turn of the 20th century would be. But The Greatest Showman tells a true story in somewhat of a glossy way. It tells the story about P.T. Barnum, and it celebrates 
quote unquote, the birth of show business and tells of this visionary who rose from nothing to create a spectacle that became a worldwide sensation. So I couldn't exactly tell you because I'm not a biographer and I don't know a lot about P.T. Barnum. I know w- what empire he started that actually just recently ended, but that's another story in general. But th- my point is that I can't exactly tell you how historically accurate this film is. My guess is, especially given that it's a musical and it's also very flashy like a circus would be, it's probably not particularly accurate. And I don't, I wouldn't count on Hugh Jackman in this movie making an accurate representation of P.T. Barnum. But that really doesn't matter. What matters is that this movie is energetic, it's fun, and it also has some really good drama in it too. So as I said before, Hugh Jackman plays P.T. Barnum and the movie emphasizes that he rose from nothing being the humble son of a tailor who befriends or actually (laughs) begins to romance um, the daughter of a wealthy family in their neighborhood by by the name of the Hallett family, and their daughter's name is Charity. Charity grows up to be Michelle Williams, and eventually, even though Hugh Jackman's P.T. Barnum is somewhat penniless, or certainly not as much of a provider as Charity's parents would prefer him to be, Charity and P.T. Barnum get married and raise two girls. But eventually, P.T. Barnum loses his job at a New York clerk's office and begins a series of ventures, including opening a museum of fantastic things. And the museum does not go over particularly well, but he takes the advice of one of his daughters where he has this He has this museum full of large taxidermied animals like elephants and giraffes. And one of his daughters actually says, don't open something with dead things in them. Open something with live things because the living is far more interesting than the dead. So P.T. Barnum takes that into advice and not only creates the circus as we know it by reputation today, but also assembles a variety of so-called freaks. I, I'm a little reluctant to say the word freaks, but that's kind of what they would be known as around the time this movie took place. So there are people who are considered freaks, such as a short man by the name of Tom Thumb, who's played by Sam Humphrey. And Tom Thumb's real name, by the way, is Charles Stratton. And there's also a bearded lady, played by Hawaiian actress Kiela Settle. And there are also some other people who do some amazing things. They're not so-called freaks, but there are acrobats such as a a beautiful young woman by the name of Ann Wheeler who's played by Zendaya and eventually P.T. Barnum has a lot of massive success with this circus and he actually gets the name the circus from a, a harsh critic of his in the newspaper but he also teams up with a playwright of of familial means whose name is philip carlisle who's played by zach efron and i thought actually one of the most interesting subplots of the movie was where zach efron begins to have a relationship with ann wheeler despite the fact that ann wheeler is black and philip carlisle is white and of course there's there's an issue there, particularly with Philip Carlyle's parents, as you might expect from the time period, but the two of them share a, a some great chemistry, not to mention one really beautiful song between them. But speaking of songs, there is actually a song in this movie that I actually thought stood out before it was nominated and won a Golden Globe for Best Original Song and was nominated for Best Original Song. The song is This Is Me, which is sung by the bearded lady in this movie, uh, Kiela Settle, and I, I thought it was uh, certainly one of the songs that stood out amongst several other songs that, while more contemporary, certainly fit the look of this movie and the feel of this film, and I actually like the fact that the the, the so-called freaks. I feel bad every time I say that, but yeah, the bearded lady and all the rest of them had a song that showcased. 
well, not only their talent, but also made them round characters. So there's a lot to love about The Greatest Showman. I thought it was well choreographed. It was glossy, yes, but we're not looking for an accurate story in this kind of film. But I thought that Michael Gracie did an amazing job. His influence from... Baz Luhrmann shows here, but I actually think The Greatest Showman is a much better film than many of the Baz Luhrmann movies I've seen, including Moulin Rouge. I, I thought it was, it, it certainly had more integrity to it and probably a, le- a lot less m- maniacal energy than Moulin Rouge did. So Greatest Showman gets my rating of a knockout. It's another film that I really had to reluctantly take off my top 10 list, but it almost made it. I think it is a superb musical and certainly one that's made for modern audiences. And it's also a good American story about a guy who rose from nothing and created an empire. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Call Me By Your Name. This is a romantic coming-of-age drama film directed by Luca Guadagnino and written by James Ivory based on the 2007 novel of the same name by Andre Aseman. And this is a movie that has a homosexual theme to it. But interestingly enough, and I wasn't aware of this before last week, but my producer, Dave Ortega, actually told me that the director of this film, the person who adapted it for the screen, and the man who wrote the the book on which it's based are all straight. And I, I found that to be fascinating because I was watching this film, and to be honest with you, I wasn't particularly connected with it for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons I thought is because I'm a straight man. But then again, when I've seen movies like Brokeback Mountain and Moonlight, movies that are also about gay men who are hiding a secret, I identified a lot more with those stories than I did with Call Me By Your Name. That being said, there are moments of Call Me By Your Name that I did enjoy. I just didn't love it as much as other critics did, but I'm not going to be apologetic about it. So, Call Me By Your Name, what is the movie about? The movie takes place in 1983, the summer of 1983, and it takes place in the Italian countryside where a 17-year-old Jewish-American-Italian boy named Elio or Elio, is living with his parents. His father is a professor of archaeology, and he's played by Michael Stuhlbarg. And before I go any further, Elio is played by Timothy Chalamet, and this is a performance for which he was nominated for an Oscar. And his mother is played by Amira Cesar. And, again, they are Americans, but they're living in Italy. I guess the the father teaches at... A, a school there that, that's not entirely clear but anyway elio is living with his parents but then they take in an american jewish graduate student by the name of oliver who's played by army hammer to live with his family and at first elio is not especially pleased with 
the fact that Oliver is staying with them. At first, they don't have very much in common. Elio is more of an introvert, whereas whereas Oliver is more carefree and happy-go-lucky. And he also doesn't like the fact that he has to vacate his bedroom for Oliver during the duration of Oliver's stay. But eventually, this resentment turns into an attraction, especially as Elio and Oliver begin to spend more time with one another. And Elio actually has a girlfriend, but he is, as it turns out, a closeted homosexual. And it's not entirely clear what Oliver's sexual orientation is. He is. It's not clear whether he is completely gay or bi or even closeted maybe even questioning <laughs> have i gone through all the letters of the lgbtq community i <laughs> i don't know exactly but in any event he he does have homosexual tendencies and the two begin to have a romantic relationship together and of course this lasts over the summer and it's one of those things where the relationship is not meant to last so that is call me by your name in a nutshell it's a movie that is quite slow and certainly there were moments of the film that i thought okay this is a perfect time to end but then there were th- another there was another slow scene that followed that and and so on and so forth but the more i think about the film the more i can appreciate it it's just not a film i particularly loved i do concede that timothy chalamet as Elio is great. And and certainly when I think back to his performance, particularly when there are scenes where he's heartbroken, especially not spoiling anything, I promise, the very last scene when the credits start rolling, I can certainly appreciate the way he's feeling. And I think that Timothy Chalamet acts very well with that. I think the problem was, even though I concede that Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer did have great chemistry together, and I also love the on-location shots in the Italian countryside, it's just not a film that really connected with me the same way that Brokeback Mountain or Moonlight did. But Brokeback Mountain and Moonlight differ from call me by your name in that both of them take place in america which almost which just recently got over its homophobia over the last couple of years whereas these two are in italy where italian people are much more open about sexuality and not hostile i i think or at least my understanding of it is they're not hostile to people to people of different sexual orientations where for the longest time homosexuality was strictly forbidden in america and i I think in the 80s particularly when homosexuality was taken off the psychology books as a mental illness and i'm not making that up it actually was I, i think italians in general are more open to those any kind of romantic relationship or at least that's my speculation so with brokeback mountain and moonlight there was certainly that forbidden love aspect of it whereas it's largely absent in call me by your name and i can certainly respect that but i i didn't particularly like army hammer's character because i did think the character of oliver was what's the word i'm looking for pretentious there's one scene in particular where the professor of archaeology father is saying what the root word of some common English word is, and Oliver says, oh, contraire, that that word is actually derivative of this language, blah, 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 and I just thought to myself, I don't like this guy. <laughs> if If... I went to college with this guy. I would eventually punch him in the face. I was a very aggressive college student. But Call Me By Your Name, I can appreciate as a good movie. It's just not a film that I connected with. And it's not a film where I felt as much emotion as I did the aforementioned movies. But I did like it for its acting, particularly by Timothy Chalamet and Michael Stuhlbarg. And it's a movie to which I give my rating of a high check out. It's still not one of my favorite films of the year, but I can appreciate it for what it is, and I am actually kind of mesmerized by the fact that the director, writer, and screenwriter are not gay, yet they made this movie. 
It's interesting. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. You want free speech? I got your free speech right here. It's all about free speech, baby. BostonFreeRadio.com I love those real sick signs They're the ones that move me A thinly blown Neurotic toe Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on SCAT TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Polka King. This one is a Netflix original starring Jack Black, Jenny Slate, and Jason Schwartzman, and it's directed by Maya Forbes, and this is her sophomore debut as a director. The last film she directed before this was the semi-autobiographical Infinite infinitely polar bear which was a really great underrated movie starring mark ruffalo and zoe saldana it was a great film but man it was heartbreaking but anyway uh, the polka king is not as heartbreaking a film as infinitely polar bear but it is a film that is based on a true story and jack black in this movie plays real life polish american polka band leader jan lewan uh, Jan Levan, however you pronounce his Polish name. It, and his first name is spelled J-A-N, so it looks like Jan, but I'm going to call him Jan. And he is a guy who is actually still active and around today as a polka singer. And he lived around the Scranton area of Pennsylvania. I think he still lives there. But his his deal is the reason that they made this movie about him is not because of his feats in polka, but also, but more because of notoriety. He was imprisoned in 2004 for running a Ponzi scheme. Apparently, according to this movie, not knowing exactly what a Ponzi scheme was. But the way he operated was that he was part of a self-titled polka band, the Jan Levan Polka group. I forgot exactly what their name was, but in in any event, he also ran a store where he sold Polish related goods, some of which were imported from Poland, and he would actually sell shares of his company, both his polka band and his Polish themed store, to investors, promising to give them 12% interest back as long as he had the money. So this is a Ponzi scheme, particularly because these kinds of investments don't usually yield interest, and the interest that comes from these investments are usually from other people who are investing in such a scheme. So he gets a stern warning from a Securities and Exchange Commission officer by the name of Ron Edwards, who's played in this movie by J.B. Smoove, to cease and desist. The only problem is that when Jan Levan looks over his paperwork, he finds that he would he's in way over his head with debt, so he can't pay his investors back. But he tells the SEC that he has paid them back, but still continues to take money from these people, even as they willingly fork over this money. So it is an interesting film just to show a well-meaning guy like this getting in over his head in a scheme he's really at first unaware he's actually doing and it's it's also 
great to see Jack Black in this film putting as much energy as he can into this character. I do think that Jack Black kind of ups the lunacy of this character, but then again, the fact you can't exactly take a polka player or a polka band leader all that seriously really but it's fascinating to see this movie as jack black as jan levon is spending this money in really questionable ways especially in ways that you wouldn't expect somebody to take on a ponzi scheme to spend them it, it, and it, it seems like he's he's spending his money frivolously yes generously you could argue that as well like he's he's taking these elaborate trips to Europe with these investors and is pretty much hanging by a, a a very thin thread when he promises to have his investors meet the then pope pope john paul ii and it looks kind of like that's not going to happen but all the, the time you're watching this film you're thinking to yourself man don't spend this amount of money and he certainly has a lot of people who believe in him such as his former beauty queen wife who's played by jenny slate and also a piccolo player in his polka band who's played by jason schwartzman who goes by the name of mickey pizzazz the stage name, of course. And he also has a nagging mother-in-law named Barb, who's played by Australian actress Jackie Weaver. There's a lot going on in this film. And actually, the the film that the Poker King reminded me the most of, not and not just because Jack Black is in it, is Bernie. And Bernie was a movie that came out in 2012, was directed by Richard Linklater, and starred Jack Black as the titular character, who is also, like the Polka King, based on somebody who actually existed and actually killed a woman and went on for about two years, making everyone in the town believe that she existed. So this is about a guy who is pretty well-intentioned, but ends up doing a really, really bad thing that ends up putting him in prison. But he's also an active member of his community, and also, unlike the real Jack Black, he is also into <laughs> music that Jack Black would probably not even touch with a 20-foot pole if he was not playing the character in on the big screen. So th there is a lot to like about The Polka King. I'm not sure if it's a movie that I would particularly take seriously. And every time I see a movie on Netflix, I always think to myself, would I actually see this movie in theaters? Of course, I'm in a position where I don't have to pay for a lot of my movies, being the film critic that I am, being as, as established as I am, thank you very much. But I think to myself, man, if I had $20 and I saw this film playing in theaters, would I go see it? And the answer to that question is probably yes, but it's still not a movie that's that I would that I would go out of my way to see. So the Poker King gets my rating of a checkout. I do think it tells a great story. It has an energetic cast. Jack Black gives his energy to this film, and it tells a story about a, a man with good intentions who just does a really, really bad thing, and getting into a Ponzi or running a Ponzi scheme is not a great thing to do. This movie gives polka leader John Levon the benefit of the doubt, but... When you step back from the film, you don't, you're not really sure if Jan Levon deserves the benefit of the doubt. I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes I do the same things over and over, until one day I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Making waves with Boston's all-Italian language program featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui sulla bostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana di ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, 
interviews, and more, making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I have a lot of movies to review. If I wanted to go my usual maximum five movies, I probably could do it with this show, but instead, I'm going to focus the last or next to last segment of my show on the Razzie Awards. This is probably one of my favorite categories or rather award shows to go over next to the Oscars. And I thought about next week dedicating the whole show to my take on the Oscar nominees and the Razzie nominees, but I will do that for the show that's after the Razzies and the Oscars, which will be on Tuesday, March 6th. So mark your calendars if you want to do that. Mark your calendars on your phone. But anyway, the Nominees for the Razzie Awards, the worst films of 2017, were announced, as usual, the day before the Oscar nominees were announced. And the uh, winners, or you want to put them in quotes, the winners of the Razzies will be announced on March 3rd, the day before the Oscars are handed out. So, here are the nominees for Worst Picture at the Razzies. The nominees are Baywatch, The Emoji Movie, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, and Transformers The Last Night. So, with the exception of Transformers The Last Night, I can vouch for the last four films in the worst picture category. I'm not vouching for Transformers The Last Night because I haven't seen it. I only know it's bad by reputation. But I declared Baywatch the worst film of the year. If I were to guess what would win the worst film of the year, my guess is probably the Emoji Movie because I've heard nothing but terrible things about that movie. And don't get me wrong, it was terrible. And I thought it was terrible. But I thought Baywatch was worse. Fifty Shades Darker is a movie that I reviewed that I acknowledged was better than Fifty Shades of Grey. I gave it my rating of a strikeout, though. I, I thought it actually was an improvement, but yeah, the, the franchise itself is, is still really bad, and I really do not like Jamie Dornan. He's, he's just a dork. So, worst actress. Th- these are some interesting nominees. The nominees are Katherine Heigl for Unforgettable, Dakota Johnson, Fifty Shades Darker, Jennifer Lawrence, Mother, Tyler Perry, Boo 2 and Medea Halloween, and Emma Watson for The Circle. Okay, now this category I actually have issues with because Dakota Johnson, I think, is probably one of the better actors in the Fifty Shades series. I think she is a good actress, and I think the only problem with Dakota Johnson is the fact that the movie sucks, it's terribly written, and she's in it. But that's it. I don't think she's a bad actress. I don't think she deserves to be nominated for that. The same thing with Emma Watson in The Circle. Uh, the Circle had many problems. I didn't think Emma Watson was one of those problems. But, again, she's nominated, so what can I do? And finally, Jennifer Lawrence in Mother. I liked the movie Mother, but this is a movie that has divided people probably more than President Trump. I thought it was a bold and brave film, and I thought Jennifer Lawrence did really well in her role. Albeit, it is a a polarizing movie, but I still don't think Jennifer Lawrence deserved to be nominated for Worst Actress. But Katherine Heigl for Unforgettable and Tyler Perry for Boo to and Medea Halloween, absolutely. And remember, Tyler Perry is being nominated for Worst Actress because he's playing Medea. That, that, that's been kind of a common theme amongst the Razzies. And this is not the first time that Tyler Perry has been nominated for Worst Actress. So if I were to pick one who's probably going to win for Worst Actress, I would probably go with Katherine Heigl, but it would probably go to Dakota Johnson, I think, which is too bad, but that's what I'm predicting. Worst Actor, the nominees are Tom Cruise, The Mummy, Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Jamie Dornan, Fifty Shades Darker. Zac Efron, Baywatch. And Mark Wahlberg for Daddy's Home 2 and Transformers The Last Night. And and this is one of those common themes of the Razzies where if there's a bad actor, all the movies they've been in is are listed and honestly mark Wahlberg probably was bad in transformers the last night i liked daddy's home too a lot better than the first one but uh, then again 
I think the person who probably should win for this category is Jamie Dornan for Fifty Shades Darker. Who do I think will win? Probably Tom Cruise for The Mummy because I concede Tom Cruise was terrible in that movie. And as for the other people who are nominated, I think they all deserve to be nominated. Even though I liked Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, I do think that Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow and the Pirates of the Caribbean series is pretty much worn out by now, but Disney may not care. It may make a comeback until one of these movies just fails. But regardless, Worst Supporting Actor. The nominees are Javier Bardem for Mother and Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, Russell Crowe for The Mummy, Josh Duhumel for Transformers The Last Night, Mel Gibson for Daddy's Home 2, and Anthony Hopkins for Collide and Transformers The Last Night. Now, I can't vouch for Anthony Hopkins because I haven't seen either of those films. I remember Collide coming out last February, but I it was just one of those films. I saw it in theaters, didn't want to waste my time with it, so I moved on. Mel Gibson I actually thought was pretty good in Daddy's Home 2, so I wouldn't nominate him for that. Um, but if, if somebody were to win for this category, I think it deserves to be Russell Crowe for The Mummy because he was terrible as Dr. Henry Jekyll and, for that matter, as Edward Hyde as well. Worst Supporting Actress, the nominees are Kim Basinger for Fifty Shades Darker, Sophia Boutella for The Mummy, Lauren Haddock for Transformers The Last Night, Goldie Hawn for Snatched, and Susan Sarandon for A Bad Mom's Christmas. So, again, this is a a list I have a few issues with. I actually did think Sophia Boutella was the best part of The Mummy, but I guess I'm the only one who thinks that. But, again, that's like being probably the best player on a team that goes 0-14 in the NFL. But if I were to pick somebody who I think would win for this category, it would probably be Kim Basinger for Fifty Shades Darker. I've seen her in better movies. I've seen her act in better movies. This movie she sucked in. Uh, Goldie Hawn and Snatched. I actually thought Goldie Hawn was the best part of Snatched. And I'm surprised that Amy Schumer wasn't nominated for Snatched because she sucked in that movie. So, yeah, to get Goldie Hawn nominated, I, I think that's a shame. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me. But I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing on with the running down of the Razzie nominations. This is usually where I go into my segment of what's coming out next, but my guess is not a lot of movies are com- not a lot of great movies are coming out the first weekend of February. I could be wrong about that, but I'm not going to go over that right now. I'm going to continue on with the Razzie nominations. Here's a great category that's always been my favorite. Worst Screen Combo. The nominees are any combination of two characters, two sex toys, or two sexual positions, Fifty Shades Darker. Great nominee. Any combination of two humans, two robots, or two explosions, Transformers The Last Night. Any two obnoxious emojis, The Emoji Movie. Johnny Depp and his worn-out drunk routine, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. And, finally, Tyler Perry in either the ratty old dress or worn-out wig, Boo 2 and Medea Halloween. So, a lot of great nominees there. My God. If I were to pick one, I would probably go with... Tyler Perry in either the ratty old dress or the worn out wig for Boo 2 and Medea Halloween because I absolutely hated that movie and I think Tyler Perry should just hang up the ratty old dress the worn out wig but if I were to choose 
one that will probably win, it would probably be any two obnoxious emojis in the emoji movie because yeah, none of none of the emojis in that film were particularly appealing, especially not the poop emoji who was voiced by Patrick Stewart. But I don't think Patrick Stewart will suffer from that career choice or rather that role choice i I think he's gonna bounce back from that but regardless moving on to the next category which is worst remake ripoff or sequel the nominees are baywatch boo 2 a medea halloween 50 shades darker the mummy and Transformers The Last Night. So a lot of, uh, again, good choices here. My personal worst would probably be Baywatch, although Boo 2 and Medea Halloween would probably come close. My guess is given the critical panning of this this film, Fifty Shades Darker is going to win that category as well. Moving on to Worst Director. The nominees are Darren Aronofsky for Mother, Michael Bay, Transformers The Last Night, James Foley, Fifty Shades Darker, Alex Kurtzman, The Mummy, and finally, Anthony Tony Leonidas, The Emoji Movie. That is, okay, of the many weaknesses of The Emoji Movie, I don't think the directing was one of them, so I would probably not choose Anthony Leonidas. Darren Aronofsky, I think, is getting a lot of crap for Mother, but I wouldn't have him win. Uh, Michael Bay is probably an obvious choice, Um, but again, I can't vouch for Transformers The Last Night. I would probably say Alex Kurtzman for The Mummy, because there is a lot that that this movie could have had potential with, particularly with The Mummy herself, but... Yeah, there are a lot of plot holes in the film, a lot of unexplained phenomena, and Tom Cruise and other actors in this movie just flat out sucked. I think that falls on the director. So if I were to choose a winner, it would be Alex Kurtzman for The Mummy. My guess is that James Foley would lose for, or would win in this category for... Fifty Shades Darker. So, finally, and I'm, I'm so happy about this because it means I haven't run out of time to talk about this. There's one last category in the Razzies, and it is Worst Screenplay. And I thought there was actually one of those awards for bouncing back, like some sort of golden raspberry, but I, I, I don't see it listed on the screen that I have. But anyway, Worst Screenplay. The nominees are... Baywatch, The Emoji Movie, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, and Transformers The Last Night. So I haven't picked any movies for, or any categories for Transformers The Last Night. That's probably one of my weaknesses in here because I haven't seen that movie. And honestly, I don't want to waste my time with that movie because I kind of know how it is. But if I were to choose Worst Screenplay... I would probably choose Baywatch only because not only did the movie suck, but it also seemed more like an episode of Saved by the Bell than it did a movie with a plot. They also chose a lot of cop movie cliches, particularly where the Baywatch lifeguards are not police officers, yet they're doing police work, and there's a police officer who says, you can't do police work, you don't have a badge, blah, blah, blah. There's that. There's also the uninspired dialogue, and also... Zac Efron's character literally saying, I'm I'm a guy who plays by his own rules. And Dwayne Johnson saying, well, we play as a team. And him saying, I'm not as a team member. So you get the idea. Anyway, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to stop and say that I thank you for listening to Words on Film. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any people who work at this station. So thank you for listening and I'll see you at the movies.